Of course, break time is over, and the kid gloves are off. Darian certainly will not be nearly as agreeable as Lamoror was, or even Maki. He hasn't even started testifying, and he's already testy with both Clavier and Apollo, and every single testimony of his will be using the Allegro theme. I talked about this during Emma's testimony, but I think this is the only game in which it happens, and apart from his Kristoff's few testimonies, in fact, he only testified once and heard about Trump, Darian is the only witness to exclusively use the game's Allegro theme. Speaking of Emma, Darian's argument is that she and Apollo heard gunshots during the third set. But, Phoenix showed up in the defendant lobby to tell the defense about something she found, a set of used-up firecrackers with gunpowder residue. Darian rebuts that the noise couldn't have been planned, but Clavier brings up the headset from the hallway as evidence that Darian could have heard their footsteps while on stage. I'll briefly note that it's a bit annoying to have the relevant evidence shoved on Apollo immediately before he uses it, but I digress. Darian asks for more decisive evidence, and Apollo brings up the mixing board again. Oh boy, get ready to see the counter rise. Pleasure. Clavier refers to the mixing board too, and Darian's misplaying, and brings up the possibility that Darian's arm would have been sore from using the murder weapon. Darian laughs at these arguments. First of all, there's no decisive evidence, and second of all, he's got no motive. After all, Romain hadn't been to the country before. But why did he come again? He was an Interpol agent, searching for Virginian cocoons. If Darian were involved in the cocoon smuggling, he'd have a very solid motive to kill. And the judge's hospital visits give Darian a great motive to want those cocoons. The Chief Justice's son has incuritis, and if anyone would be more likely to keep the deal secret than the detective, it'd be him. Again, though, there's no proof. Besides, how would Darian get the cocoon over to America? That's also rather simple to answer, actually. Clavier's guitar was vacuum-sealed in Virginia to preserve it, meaning... Are you saying that guitar was... Which the cocoon's this small, it would have been very easy to use your guitar as a mule to smuggle a cocoon out of Virginia! Well, what? Which reminds me, Prosecutor Gavin, that guitar had some work done on it recently, right? Work? Good memory, Ed Forehead. Well, you know how guitars have a round hole in the front. It's called the sound hole. Well, they found something attached to the wood just inside the hole. A broken device of some sort. A broken device? Yes, this, in fact. An igniter? Exactly! Consider this, if you will. What if that igniter wasn't the only thing that was attached inside your guitar? You, you mean... He means this, of course. Ah, ah! There was a way to get a cocoon out of the country. They could use Icky Prosecutor Gavin's privileged guitar as a mule. And who better to do that than someone with access? Like a member of the band! Yo! Order, order, order! So the igniter was placed in there for a clear reason, it seems. It was a safety precaution! A precaution? Ah, air forehead. At last it all comes together. Every strange thing that happened that day. Care to review? Maestro, the gentle sounds of Lemur's ballad, if you please. First, my keys were stolen. A harmless misdemeanor. Which forced me to break the lock on my guitar case. The key was stolen to retrieve the cocoon from the guitar. I, I she. But, things didn't go so well. The smuggler wasn't counting on the car being wrapped. Only a member of the band could get near that case. Unwrapping the guitar would raise too many suspicions. Then, the concert began. Right about this time, a very large problem presented itself to the smuggler. Watch that. Mr. Latouse. Ah! Mr. Latouse, an undercover agent, was onto something. He would have known about the guitar. He'd only have to check the shipping records. So, Mr. Latouse tried to examine the guitar himself. If the cocoon were confiscated then, the gig would be up. The only thing left for the smuggler to do was to get rid of the whole lot. It's over. Press the switch, now. The guitar burst into flames, and the cocoon was lost. And then... Mr. Latouse died, with Lemmy Roar there to witness it. There's your case.
Darian's not done laughing. Darian didn't go to Virginia with Clavier after all. But someone else in this case has been there for most of his life. Who did he tell to press the switch? There's only one person who meets all the requirements of the accomplice. And that person is the defendant Makito Bai! But, but Mr. Justice, he's your client! The defense attorney accusing his client! <laughs> That's a new one! I assure you, no one is more unhappy about this than I. But I am here to defend him in the murder of Mr. Latus. And I stand by my statement earlier that he is innocent of that particular crime. Indeed, a defendant is Borginian. He does meet the basic requirements to be the accomplice. But what if it was, in fact, Lamador? It couldn't have been. Well, you seem sure of yourself. The reason is electronic signals, Your Honor. Electronic signals? Recall that this remote only works to a range of 30 feet. Beyond that, it's useless. Hmm, yes, that's true. Now, think back to the testimony. When the shooter made his transmission, Lamador was in the air vent, right above the dressing room where the shooter stood. Let's look at the stage diagram. This is the area that the remote could reach from the air vent. Well, looking at this, it seems that Lamador still could have done the deed. No. When the shooter made that transmission, the stage was slightly different than shown here. It was in the middle of the guitar serenade. Part of the stage was raised. Prosecutor Gavin and the Lamador stand-in were in the air. They were on a tower, which happens to be 15 feet tall. In other words, the remote couldn't have worked from Lamador's position in the air vent. Ah! Well, Detective Crescend, what do you say to that? Your Honor. Like every time before, Darian has a counter to Apollo's latest attack. He, again, really? Explains that Maki was playing the piano throughout the song. Another cut to the song is made and Clavier makes an errant remark. The song sounds just a little different than it should now that he's focused on it. During the second verse of the song, when Lamar heard Darian's voice, Maki was playing a tune so simple that he could have had a free hand to press the switch. It all makes sense, but there's no proof, no hard evidence. I'll finish off this case quickly, but let's just say I have some aversions to how this plays out. Maki still hasn't testified about the cocoon smuggling, and Apollo presses that, if he does, Darian will be found guilty. Darian tries to argue that Maki will be put to death for cocoon smuggling, but Apollo and Clavier turn that around, and claim that he'll be tried in America, whether for smuggling or the murder of an Interpol agent. <sighs> Don't worry there. I'll get... I'll get you out of the country. I'll set you up someplace. A hidden mansion. Real nice. You want a house made out of cool cookies or no? A house made out of pianos. C come on. Please. Don't talk. I know it's a semi-satirical video game, and I'm far from the first person to make this criticism, but Apollo shouldn't need to prove that Darian did anything. I literally looked up, do lawyers in Japan have to find the real criminal, and the burden of proof is supposedly on the prosecution to find a defendant guilty without any reasonable doubt there, just as in the United States. And I'm well aware that the satire of the legal system became much more pointed in this game and in the rest of this trilogy. And I'm extremely well aware that the ending of this case is meant to foreshadow the premise of the next. But... I can't get past the fact that, in just about every case, it's circumstantial evidence that's able to pin the crime against the defendant, and it takes decisive evidence to prove anything about a witness's misdeeds. Maybe if there was a game with no explicit defendants, themed entirely around a series of investigations to corner the true culprit outside of court. In any case, the lack of proof, which I'm sure was done on purpose to coincide with the themes of this game, does make Darian just a bit less satisfying to take down but I don't fault them for trying. As I've said numerous times now, Tournament Serenade tries a lot of interesting things, and my verdict is that it happens to execute on most of them poorly. 
Apollo and Emma being all but witness to the crime? Hell yeah, that's a really cool angle to start the investigation on. It's a bit of a shame that Apollo and Emma's perspective doesn't matter that much, but so goes most first day testimony. Lamoureux being a witness that lies to protect the defendant is unique and handled well in my opinion, and that most of her actual account is a truth that happens to contradict the case's base assumptions is beautiful. Darian being named straight up by Lamoureux is a gem of a concept that puts him in the back of the player's mind for the entire second half of the case. The way he interacts with everyone cements this, and his combativeness in court does make him more fun to defeat, but his story is a bit underdeveloped. How did he get into contact with Maki, for instance? On the topic of plot holes, the argument to convict Maki is far too many. Even though he can see, and even though he can understand English, and even though he has a motive, which is only given by him after he's declared innocent, he couldn't have shot that gun without any injuries. There were multiple lines of dialogue referencing how hard it was to use the victim's weapon, and yet everyone assumes that a literal child would have been able to handle it so well he only missed once? Again, it's not meant to be realistic, but there's no way a reasonable person would convict Maki. Some cases in real life do go without a murderer, after all. That would have been an interesting angle to take this case. Apollo or Clavier or someone trying to push the case further along to find the real killer, even as it becomes more and more obvious that Maki is innocent. If something like that would have explained the continued prosecution of Maki, then I'd have been much more invested in the case. Or maybe the case would have been made even worse for it. It already treads a lot of experimental ground after all. One more thing. I really don't like that the judge's newspaper and firecrackers are given to Apollo so late in the trial. The firecrackers Phoenix gives literally right before the one time they're used, and Apollo could have easily found them with Emma during the investigation, even on day one. Moments like that, as well as a few instances where Apollo or Clavier figure some things out for the player, can make sense to speed things up and give the back and forth dialogue between the characters a bit more realism, but too much of it ruins player immersion and turns the visual novel from a game into a book. This will be relevant later. Everything will be relevant, in fact. It's time for the final case to begin. We'll see a criminal die, we'll see another revealed, and we'll even see the trial that cost Phoenix Wright his license to practice law. We will explore Phoenix's past and his present, and find out how the mysteries laid out in the past three cases connect to each other. We will also explore Japan's real legal history, and how its events shaped the making of this game. The last hand is about to be played. Seven years of crimes, lies, and betrayal, as well as seven decades of judicial debate in Japan, have led to turnabout succession. We will soon learn how Phoenix lost his badge, how Trucy lost her father, how Apollo gained his bracelet, and how a young girl, swallowed up by a criminal mastermind, will regain hope. This has been Mike the Ente. Please like and subscribe.